Just like most consumer products, graphics cards are advertised and marketed on the best of the range. And the best is always the most expensive, but rarely the best value. It is also almost never the lion's share of the market. This is consumed by the entry and mid-range cards, which is where the smart money is. Just take a look at the Steam hardware survey. These offer almost always the same feature set as the very top end, but slightly lower performance for a far more attractive price. And competition helps push that forward for us, the consumer. Step forward the RX 5600 XT from PowerColor. Not only is this a very powerful GPU, it could be one of the best value upgrades for your rig. It packs all of the features and benefits from AMD's newest architecture in RDNA. This Navi card is complete with its superb Radeon Adrenaline Suite, which offers a very comprehensive selection of capture, tweaking, overclocking, and even streaming options, all in one package installed with your drivers. And you don't even need to create a profile and contact details just to use it. How refreshing. Now, before I get into the important section of its performance and comparisons, let's dive into this particular independent hardware card being a 5700 almost entirely aside the removal of one 2 gig RAM node and associated 64 bit controller. This also means that it has the very same high quality and clean finish of that top tier range right down to its 14 gigabits per second memory chips. No, not the slower ones here. This is exactly the same chips as you'll see on the 5700 and 5700 XT. No BIOS flash is required. This is how they work straight out of the box. Now that matte black plating complete with embossed Red Dragon logo and dual axial fans on the top look great. And the cooling with that thick copper heatsink, you can tell this is no budget card and it shows. Dual BIOS is just a flick away with an overclock BIOS as standard or a cool and quiet silent mode if you are one of the select few who like to play games in church. <laughs> Now this does reduce the clock and voltage to keep acoustics lower, but all my tests here on this still very quiet yet far more powerful overclocked mode, which offers out of the box 1750 megahertz on the core as standard. This is the boost clock, a decent bump over that advertised 1620, which can help hit those vital few milliseconds more. In addition, as I say, the memory is fully clocked. You can overclock this slightly more, but I'll touch on that at the end of the video. The fact it has no throbbing LEDs is a bonus for me. Less power is needed from its 8-pin connector and the clean finish, black shroud and stylist aesthetic are not ruined by a cycling tribute to its misconstrued Blade Runner reference. It is a solid card with enough weight to know the plate and heatsink are not here for decorative reasons. At around 9.5 inches in length, it will fit into all ATX towers and even micro ATX towers if you've got enough space. Unless you're going, honey, I shrunk my computer size, and then you're probably going to be a little bit out of luck. But that covers most of the market. Once connected and screwed in, we can stop admiring the looks of this and see how she runs. Although many sites and channels tell you these cards are no good for 4K games, this is untrue. This card can run all modern games at 4K and you may be surprised at just how well it can. But that said, it is of course most suited to the ideal sweet spot of 2560 by 1440 or to 3200 by 1800 which can easily be configured in the Radeon settings as a custom resolution and then upscaled to your 4K or downscaled if you preferred. Now this is a simple set and forget option that makes it a great choice for 4K gaming with little sacrifice if you want higher performance. Now you will of course have to tweak those settings a little more if you're looking for 4K resolutions. With that said though, it is still in excess of both current premium consoles and will still compete with the new PS5 and Series X when they launch across the majority of third party titles. Now due to keeping this video focused and the amount of cards I have access to, I will mostly be comparing this to the direct Nvidia competition in the RTX 2060 Super, demonstrated here by my slightly better around 5-10% to but no longer available 2070. Now this card is marginally better than the 2060S but with a similar 399 price tag. It's also the best you can expect from the Nvidia in this range, although it is, like I say, around £100 more. And before I get dived on, there was the RTX 2060 KO, which was released in America. I don't think it released in the UK, but this is a cut-down version that's pretty much the same spec and therefore much worse than this and will favour the 
power colour more than the Nvidia side and this is a standard tactic for Nvidia and many other companies to try and reduce the impact of new hardware. And good luck finding a KO card. No, this is really comparing it against that RTX 2060 Super and obviously the 2070 itself. When you're upgrading a GPU or adding one, it's not as much about cost, it is about value which I cover more at the end of the video. So with that we can take a look at the two card specs against each other, a close call with a 25% reduction in VRAM and associated bandwidth with this completing the only variance between them on paper specs. Now to help many that may be in the market from the Polaris range upgrade, I also include comparisons to my older 4GB 470 or 570 card, which was an excellent 1080p card from only a couple of years ago. Now this is a genuine upgrade option from that, and I feel this covers the majority of the market and most likely all the options you will be looking at. Let those pixels pump. Now I've taken a broad range of GPU straining titles to put these through their paces, 14 games in total that cover many engine strengths and years to offer an holistic sample of the market, as we do not play only one game, enabling us to see the average across a cross section starting at 1080 then 1440 and 4K, these are all run at maximum settings unless otherwise stated on the specific title. Now no better place to kick off such a titanic battle than at night in Arkham. Now infamous for its less than stellar PC port at launch, it has been one of my most beloved games of this generation. The PC port is much better now, but can still hammer the best of machines. Starting at 1080p, we can see both cards hit that 90fps ceiling, but they do not remain there for long. Using the most stressful section of the game, driving around Arkham in the Batmobile, you can see the frame rates can drop and the consistency is affected. The tests here running at 1080p show that both cards are very close and then arguably they are both in excess of a 1080p game most of the time. This is not the best title to stress hardware as it's still not the most optimized for that environment, but Unreal Engine, including Unreal Engine 4, can be a difficult mistress to manage across multiple pieces of hardware. This means that when you look at the specs between the two cards, the difference at 1080p is pretty much non-existent. Give or take margin of error a variety of runs, that's the case for 1440p as well, as does 4K, although the RTX 2070 unsurprisingly pulls a little bit of a gap here, biggest of the lot, due to the fact that it has more bandwidth and therefore 25% more VRAM as well, which helps it out the higher up the food chain you go with resolutions. My RTX or RX 470 here does a decent job of trying to hang in there and it does a decent job at 1080p very close to the rest of the cards but once you move beyond this it's really out of its comfort zone due to that bandwidth limitation and the lack of VRAM only having 4 gigabytes. Next up is Ubisoft generation defining Assassin's Creed Unity which pushes hardware just as well now as it did back then. Really pushing ahead of the curve we can see that both these cards can push upwards of 120 FPS at 1080p with an average of 85. They are more than good enough to run this game as well as you can, so long as you've got a good CPU to keep it going. The same cannot be said for the old RX 470, which really lags behind both at 1080p, 1440, and specifically at 4K. It's unplayable, and that's not a surprise, but you can even see here that at 1080p on this particular card, the leap to the 5600 XT is over double both on average and more on highs. It's a substantial substantial improvement on quality and a realistic upgrade that you will see the difference immediately. But pushing these cards further up the food chain at 1440, we just see the RTX 2070 pipped by the 5600, the first win here at a high of 103, but the average is slightly lower, 70 versus 73. And then at the full fat 4K, we're getting 49 and 51 as the highs, but a 38 and 42 as the average means they're pretty much nigh on identical in terms of performance. And this is true across all resolution ranges. Next up to discuss is id Software's Epic Doom 2016, which has a ceiling of 200 FPS, and both these cards hit that ceiling. And looking at it at 1080p, they are more than enough to push this as high as the engine can go using that Vulkan API. Both support it, along with DirectX 12. This means that you've got a great option of titles and engines to run on these cards without any issues or concerns that they won't run well. Obviously depending on the developer at hand and how well they've used it, 
So to briefly explain the graphs as we run to the end, and I'll just let the graphs play out, the grey and the red are the lows and the 1% lows. The grey is the most important because that's what you'll get over average in terms of micro stutter. The top blue, the 200, the highs, that's kind of not that vital because it's all dependent on where you look. The most important two parts of the graph are the 1% lows and the green, the average FPS. That's where the meat of the matter is, and that's where you concentrate your effort. And at 1080p, there's hardly anything split in these two machines. But again, it, the game is capped at 200. 200 FPS, so that does have a small impact. Moving up to 1440, we see a similar situation, both getting very close to 200 FPS, whereas that RX 470 is really not in the same ballpark. And then 4K sees the biggest gap, something which you will consistently see throughout the runs of titles here. 4K is where the 5600 XT struggles the most, and you have to just lower some of those settings. But everything here is identical, bar a couple of them where noted, where I've had to drop the text resolution down one rung from the top level, Doom Eternal and Red Dead Redemption 2, because it's not possible to run it. You run out of VRAM on this 5600 at 6 gig, whereas you've got 8 gig on the 2070. Aside that, everything else is absolutely identical. And most of the time, dropping those won't make a big performance impact. It will have a slight impact, but not as big as dropping resolution. I'll catch you at the end where we summarize the entire run, all the games, and that most important area of Bang for Book. That brings us to the end of the GPU run and as you can see the overall percentages are very close but those 4K resolutions are the most impactful on the 5600 XT and that's down to the VRAM, there's not a lot you can do other than play with the settings. Example here and the worst on the test was Moto GP20. 
At 1080p it slightly outperforms the RTX 2070 and at 4K it underperforms by around 50%, the worst on the test. And this is largely down to the fact that the team probably haven't optimised it going from those incremental increases in resolution. Everything's being pumped up to the same level, not the standard practice. You can get away with a little bit of tweaking here and there. Therefore, just by dropping the resolution down to 3200 by 1800 you can see performance is pretty much identical to the RTX 2070 at 4K and you would struggle to see the difference. And that pretty much sums up the entire test across the board and just how good this is as a 4K card but as a 1440p one it is exceptional. And that's borne out by the summary across all these tested games compared against the RTX 2070. It is only 1.2% deficit at 1080p. That rises to 7.4% at 1440 and then the biggest gap 13.6% between the RTX 2070. So overall, it's 7.4% down on that 2070 or 2060 Super. And bearing in mind, that is a 42.5% more expensive card in the UK, might be more or less in the US, Australia, Europe, wherever you may be, but relatively, that means that it's 29% worse value, the RTX 2070 or the RTX 2060 Super, than this RX 5600 XT. And that's relative to itself, 100% from that price up to 399 for the 2070 Super. So that means that you're getting much better value and there's all the additional benefits that I know both cards have benefits as the RTX options on the RTX cards. There's very few games that use that, Metro being one of them. And the Navi cards has things like Fidelity FX, integer scaling, Radeon Boost, Radeon Anti-Lag, and obviously FreeSync 2 and other benefits that the cards offer. And that means that they trade blows in terms of pros and cons, which results in the fact that you pick on performance and value. And in that sense, the 5600 XT clearly wins. And on top of that, if you are in the market for buying a graphics card that's going to last for the next few years, certainly into the next generation and, in, and way into that, then an AMD card will always age better than an NVIDIA one because most teams and engines design their games around the specific AMD architecture. In this case, RDNA 2 and the Navi cards. So, with all that wrapped up and covered, what are my final thoughts on the 5600 XT? I think it's the best value graphics card you can buy right now on the market it's the best amd range it's the best of the nvidia range there is no better card to spend your money on you can spend more you can get better performance but you're not really going to get much more bang for your book and in fact i'm pretty sure you'll get less and that means that this is my recommended card for this year and unless the navi 2 cards later in the year really ramp up i don't think you're going to miss out a great deal over the next two to three years while teams get used to using the hardware and maximizing more from it. With that, another video draws to a close. I hope you found this useful and the information contained and the style that which I've done it. I'm trying to mix up a little bit, so please give your thoughts and feedback. And again, I'm completely self-funded and independent, and I'm completely honest. I'm not liable to anybody, so I'm giving you the honest facts and figures as they come here. So you can always trust what I put together to give you the honest facts. You can help by subscribing, sharing, and liking, because that all helps the YouTube algorithm, which is not my biggest fan, unfortunately. So anything you guys and girls can do is greatly appreciated. Appreciate it. Anyway, enough waffling. I'll see you very soon on the next one. Come on, pretty boy. Pretty boy? You're kidding me. Pretty boy? Now! I hope you got more than that.